gave you various bits of nitrogen yesterday, and then I've saved up a few stakeholder stories. And the question is, who are we talking with when we, we do our work? Uh, usually we're talking with the computer and data sets or whatever. But anyway, after we've talked with the computer data sets, we might be talking with some other people, and there's a zillion logos that I had in my work. So I'm going to give you three stories, and then we can think about it afterwards and think about how we react, how your stakeholders are. So think who are the people you're working with. So I'm going to give you three stories. The first one is nitrogen and a few chickens. It's really small scale, but interesting. Uh, the next one is nitrogen to whole United Nations. That's sort of the opposite extreme. And the third one, nitrogen public engagement and press and talking to the wide world. So let's start very quickly then. And the starting point for the nitrogen and the few chickens is the Habitats Directive under the European Union, which is a very strong piece of legislation. It gets a series of designated sites, uh, special areas of conservation, special protection areas for birds. Uh, the EU envisages a high level of protection. I think uh, Pedro showed yesterday, or someone showed yesterday, some of where those space areas of conservation are in Portugal. And critically, a precautionary principle applied. Now, let's take one of the articles of that directive. Any plan or project not directly connected with or necessary to the management of the site, but likely to have a significant effect, shall be subject to appropriate assessment. There's a whole host of discussion of what does appropriate mean, what's an appropriate assessment. Anyway, that discussion goes on forever with stakeholders. Um, in view of its implications. So basically, you want to do something, you've got to have an assessment that demonstrates whether it's safe or not. In the light of the conclusion of the assessment, um, the competence of authorities shall agree to the panel project only after having ascertained that it will not adversely affect with a proportionary approach. So there's several things with this, because this is really proportionate. It means you can't do anything unless you've proved it's safe. Uh, but there's a few hooks. So first of all, uh, will it be assessed? And often things happen on nature areas which don't get assessed because there was nobody to notice it. So this is like a sleep, this directive is like a sleeping dragon. If you wake the dragon up, then it's very aggressive to protect. But if you get under while well, the dragon is not awake, you can do what you like. Um, so the next thing is a plan or project. What is a plan or project? There's a whole host of debates about what is a plan or project. Because if you want to do something and even pass while the dragon is awake, you convince the dragon that you are neither a plan nor a project. This is interesting. So in Northern Ireland, they plan to double the number of cows. But that's not a plan, because it's, a government, it's not a government document. The government have issued it, it motivated it, but it comes from industry. But this is just an industry manifesto. It's a manifesto, not a plan or project. Therefore, it will not be assessed. Therefore, we will not consider what is the risk of doubling the number of cows in Northern Ireland. So, very interesting debate on what is a plan or project. And this is going across the whole of Europe, these issues. Um, apart from the UK in about two years' time, when we'll have no nature at all, but that's another story. Um, once Brexit, if Brexit gets through. So here's the example, um, the farmer and the few chickens. So a farmer wanted to start a free-range chicken farm in the county of Dorset in England. A free-range means a chicken go outside, they're really happy, friendly, ecologically suitable um, chicken. Um, there's only 2,500 chickens, this is tiny. So in far farms we often have in the UK have got a million chicken. With a, this is a tiny farm. The problem for the farmer was that the farm was right next to a special area of conservation, about the distance between here, me and that door away, not far. Um, now, interestingly, back to the sleeping dragon, farming is not considered development, therefore it's not a plan or project, therefore it would not normally be assessed. So the dragon would sleep. The problem for the farmer is actually he wanted to put a house up. And he was living in a green belt. And in a green belt, you can't have a house. Unless you are an agricultural dwelling. In which case, you can have a house. But to be an agricultural dwelling and prove that you should have your house there, you have to demonstrate 
a viable agricultural business. So the guy scratches his head and says, what on my small piece of land can I have as a business? I'll have chickens, because I had them before. So he makes a chicken business and has to prove that he's got a viable chicken business. Now at this point, we start entering a public inquiry because he has his planning application refused. They say, you can't have your house because the chicken will have an impact. But he only needed the chicken to get the permission in Greenland. So we're on a very interesting chain of events. That's the first public inquiry in the UK to test whether ammonia, uh, a form of nitrogen in the atmosphere, would then have significant impacts. So who were the stakeholders in this discussion? So there we are, we've got the farmer, obviously, the farmer's agent, the farmer's lawyer. We've got, again, it's the council, English Nature is a responsible authority, um, the lawyer, the neighbours, the former girlfriend. <laughs> the former girlfriend stood up in the public inquiry and spoke for 20 minutes on the topic of why you should not trust this man. Um, <laughs> so this is real life. Here we are, this is great. See, our data on ammonia fluxes have come into a room where people are concerned, their lives are depending upon this. Will he get his house? Will the nature survive? Will the former girlfriend get her own back? Okay, and then there we are. So uh, the, these guys are paying me. I'm the scientific expert. And my job is not to argue one way or the other, but to say what the evidence say. Okay, so here's the picture of the place. And we've got a little light here. This is his, this is a barn. And he wants to turn that barn into a house. In fact, he's already moved in. <laughs> How to annoy authorities, do things without asking their permission and then let them find out after. So he's already moved in. He's now asking for retrospective planning permission. Okay, and he wants to have his chickens here in this field. Now, his, the red line is the boundary of the special air conservation, which is a heathland, very sensitive to the nitrogen heat condition, lots of nice lichens in principle. Um, a border of trees here. Those tree border, as Uli will tell you, will probably help protect this area of heathland from the farm. Interestingly, we went to this with the lawyers and the, the different stakeholders, and the local nature conservation manager immediately before we arrived, had removed all of these trees. Now his argument, well this really annoyed the lawyer, but his argument was, well if there's no impact of the ammonia, those trees don't need to be there. And if there's an impact of ammonia, you shouldn't have the farm anyway. And our conservation objective is people and not trees. But you can see why that would annoy a lawyer in the context of just about to have a public decision, because those would protect from the ammonia, but anyway, so there we are. This is the site. It's quite a complicated site. Um, but basically, chicken out in the fields in little hutches to run around. Um, and we have to do the assessment with very little measurement. There's no measurement here. It's like expert judgment. So let's take a few views. The farmer's view. He wants a house, wants a business. Uh, any ammonia is actually irrelevant. It's nothing to do with it because the permission he's asking for his permission to build his house, or to live in his house. He's not asking for permission for chickens, because chickens are not development. Chickens go under the radar. And the farm is anyway too small, it's a tiny farm, and with good practice he'll have negligible emissions. It took him a long time to say that, but that's essentially after several hours what we get to. Um, English Nature, so they argue that the farm and the building have to be considered as a whole. Um, he would only get permission for his house because it's a combination for an agricultural worker. Therefore, the business is integral to it. Therefore, we have to assess the impact of the business. Everything connects. Um, the Heathland's a special area, therefore, there has to be high level of protection, precautionary principle, and they argue that the scientific evidence would be damaging. So, they're my evidence. So, expert witness to these guys report the understanding of where we are, what we know about ammonia. I describe the emission, how it comes up from the, into the atmosphere, disperses and come back down, um, and then get cross-examined, and they try to break my evidence and say that I'm an idiot or whatever. But that was actually very easy, because they knew nothing about the topic. Um, 
So interestingly, I gave my evidence was that I expected that there could be effects within 300 meters. Um, and I expected probable effects within the first 50 meters. Now, this one, of course, is much stronger, but you could say that one in a proportional approach is the relevant test. But we, we never came down to that battle in the end, whether probable or possible um, would be the key decider. I used a screening model that maybe Ed and Uli can show you on the web if you would like to play with it, um, where you put in the size of your farm and look at concentrations downwind and see what increase of deposition. And I got an extra 15 kilograms right next to the farm of deposition. Now remember, a critical load might be of that magnitude. Um, and I was expecting the heaven lichens will be disappearing. So that's where we go. And then the, the inspector goes away and, and considers all of this, uh, this activity. And uh, in the end, well, you can think what you would decide. We've got a group full of ecologists here, so it's a bit biased. Um, so, OK, so who would, uh, hands up, you've got your evidence presented. Who is going to favor the farmer? The farm is independent from the house. All he needs is the house. Will anybody defend the farmer? Stick your hand up, you're going to defend the farmer. Okay, yes, good, super. Okay, any, who's against? Yeah, you are. It's okay. Uh, who, who would defend, who would go with the nature organization, say so you cannot have it? Okay, we've got one hand, two hands, okay, hold seven hands. Who is, who is not put their hand up? Who is, who is lying has not put their hand up and telling their hand up? Okay, so we've got, most people are going to uh, uh, say to tell them to push up on the way. And, uh, so the inspector uphold English Nature's view completely. He said, yes, you're only applying for a house, but we have to make the link. So remember, the dragon was asleep, and the dragon wouldn't, he could, if he didn't want to have the house, he could have just put the chicken out. And the um, inspector says, yes, that may well be a loophole, but in this case, you're not in the loophole, because the dragon has woken up. We now have to make the connection. You only wanted a house. Um, we have to make them. The effects are real. Therefore, he has to refuse it. So the poor guy didn't get his house. A girlfriend was happy um, in her anger. OK. So there's an example of a really small scale ammonia. And the Moninier bog I showed you yesterday, some dying plants showed what happens when the farmer did get his farm and all the nature disappeared. So I'm going to go on now to the other end of the spectrum to nitrogen in the United Nations. And I showed you this slide yesterday about how emissions have changed of air pollution. The NOx is coming down nicely, the ammonia they've hardly touched. The ammonia is cheaper to abate than the NOx, but we don't do anything. And the reason we don't do anything is because it's the farmers, and the farmers have a large lobby in the parliaments and environment ministries are smaller than farming ministries. That's basically it. Um, but there's an awful lot of discussion that then goes through the process and where each side is, is trying to manipulate the other, etc. cetera. Um, a, a European farming union, just before a vote on National Emissions Ceiling Directive, wrote to all of the MEPs the day before the vote with a rather long and confusing letter telling them that ammonia is all confusing, methane is all confusing, you shouldn't do it, please vote against. So there's really strong lobbying uh, going on in these, these debates. So these, we, we've engaged with this, and one of the issues that I say it doesn't make progress is because this challenge of farming is now an international game. Um, the European farmers will be concerned that if they make a clean chicken house or clean cow house, it will be more expensive. And therefore, we'll just have cheap imports from another country outside Europe who will grow the animals, import them with lower environmental practices, standards in their area, and get imported and undercut them, and they will, their, their business will go out of business. So this pushes us more to the global context to understand those global dynamics as well. And one of the global efforts we've done, we were, on the back of the European Nation Assessment, we were commissioned to do this report for the United Nations Environment Programme, the challenge to use more food, food with uh, more food and energy with less pollution. Our nutrient world. Um, again, we worked to get the messages out, and very fortunately for us, this was actually happening at the time of the horse meat scandal in the UK, 
when everybody was concerned about eating horses. So food choices became very easy to get into the press at that point. So one has to be opportunistic. Uh, we got lots of press as a result of this. Um, the secret to getting the press was to go to a press centre and not just making our own press launch. If we just issue a, a press release, everybody ignores it. If we go through the press centre, we get lots of attention. Uh, the hard thing is to get into the press centre. Um, let's just say, what, what were the messages we were sharing in that report? The first was that we need to look at nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus as a cycle. We've got these resources on the right. We've got opportunities for recycling. We've got the, the nitrogen oxides are producing as well and recycling. And each of those buttons, like I showed yesterday, is an opportunity for taking action. The one, again, that we used as the hook was this one. Food choices and diet gets us in the press. And um, we get a conversation about um, food and nitrogen. At the end of the press conference, by the way, they asked us, what do you think about the horse meat scandal? <laughs> and that was great, because I reply, well, it's very interesting. It makes us think about our food choices and environment and everything. And we have another lady from France who loves her food. And she says, I love my food. It's beautiful. And uh, I'm really very concerned about all of this. And then we have a Dutch man, a big Dutch guy, who says, it's good meat. <laughs> anyway, the, the, <laughs> the uh, press and the chair lady for this meeting were completely silent, completely embarrassed. You cannot say that in the UK. Um, but it made it memorable as a result. And they went away having learned more and it stuck in their head. He should have said, well, you might be surprised to hear it, but, or scary as it might be, in the Netherlands, where I come from, there was actually a very long history of eating horse meat. Yeah, I know it's scary, but this is what we do in our country. And actually, the people think it's good meat. And he might have just about taken them. But uh, I think that shows that understanding the audience, etc. Okay, so we look at this recycling. We want to improve the efficiency of that overall system. We want to talk about money choices with the people. This is where we might have a 20% improvement in nitrogen use efficiency in the world. What would it do? And this is our bottom line numbers in billions per year. Really rough and ready estimates, but we declare them to be rough and ready estimates. So we're not hiding anything. Um, we're estimating a net benefit of $170 billion a year. We're saving $23 billion worth of fertilizers. Environmental health benefits of 160, we estimate an implementation cost of 12. Now, the interesting thing with those numbers, which are really ropey, is that that's the best number, um, but this is by far the biggest number. So whatever you think is the environmental health benefit cost, it's the dominating number. So those social externalities of ecosystems and health, and water pollution and air pollution are the big numbers. We can have a big debate about what they are, um, but that's the big one. The second thing, oops, right. the second thing is that this number, which is real money, is bigger than the real cost in many cases. So there's a mobilisation for the farmer. So there's a basis there for a conversation uh, with people, conversation with the countries in the UN. So this kind of thing is what we've been playing at, and then the United Nations Environment Program says, well, we want to take it further. We want to imagine that we've actually got a proper science support system for the whole of the world's nitrogen cycle um, for the years ahead. What would that be? And that's what we've now been working on uh, with this thing, which is maybe mentioned a few times, the International Nitrogen Management System, for which you can think of it as something like an international climate Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, but for nitrogen, and working with the United Nations Environment Programme. So we've launched that this year, um, bringing evidence together to inform policies in the public. Um, it's said to be a 60 million project, but UNEP live in a funny world, and most of that is contributions in kind. This is the cash cost. Um, so they're actually putting in that. They're putting in this much cash to mobilise this much worth of effort from a network of 80 organisations across the world. What's it look like? We've had a very long stakeholder process. Now, talking about the stakeholder engagement with the public inquiry, it was done in a year or so and a couple of key meetings. This process 
has been working since 2012, and we're only starting now, so it's been a five year stakeholder engagement process, including games where different players try to take over the process, who's really in charge, what are we really doing, agendas are changing. Um, but this is what we come out with, um, a work with four packages, looking at tools for understanding the nitrogen cycle, global and regional quantification of flows, impacts, threats, benefits, regional demonstration. The world is a varying place, so what happens if we study in South Asia, East Asia, Africa, uh, differently? An awareness raising, knowledge sharing, which they've emphasised they really want a lot of. So you can see there the boxes out of that, in the end, a better basis for transformational change. So that's where we are at the moment. Um, and I'm not going to go into any more detail on this, because this is about just understanding the context of this work. But I want to give a couple of slides which recognise the fact that nitrogen is cost all the wages, the water, air, greenhouse ecosystem source. How do we address that fragmentation? And this is a diagram that I prepared when I was at something called the UNEA, the United Nations Environment Assembly, um, which is trying to understand this fragmentation in the policy realm. Because essentially we have different policy worlds and they're all completely on their own, doing their own thing, being too busy to talk to the rest of the world. So take the Montreal Protocol. Nitrous oxide is now the major stratospheric ozone depletion. So stratospheric ozone, ozone hole thinning, um, nitrous oxide is the main driver of that now because the CFCs have basically been cleaned up. Interestingly, that's under the Vienna Convention. The Vienna Convention mentions N2O, but currently the Montreal Protocol does not include N2O. So there's a whole discussion there about how to go further with N2O. Um, in the Convention on Biological Diversity, that's a challenge because we contribute through the International Nitrogen Initiative data on the nitrogen indicator for their targets, their HE targets. Um, but as a negotiating place, it's incredibly diverse itself. Biodiversity is reflected in issue diversity in this Convention on Biological Diversity. Go to one of those meetings and you will see a hundred issues from nitrogen deposition to coastal zones to people rights in the Amazon. It's everything. Now that's very interesting because it means that nitrogen is there, but it's very hard to spearhead the nitrogen effort from that convention. The climate convention faces other challenges. Nitrous oxide for long-lived climate gas is there, but they are facing so many other challenges about energy and, and governance that in the end, some work is done there, particularly on emissions inventories, but it becomes a hard place to spearhead nitrogen. They've got no time to think about biodiversity or air pollution interactions. They want, they've got their own agenda. So their problem is good, very big, but over busy. This air convention is the one I've had most to do with and where we've had the most success. And that's where we already have this task force on reactive nitrogen. Uh, Claudia Cordeville is one of the co-chairs of that task force. She's just prepared a document that reviews the national codes of good agricultural practice that is a mandatory requirement. And in Geneva, in June, she'll be there to present that in the UN headquarters in Geneva in front of 30 countries to say, how well have we done? The message, in fact, is that only about 10 out of 25 countries have done what they should do. So that's for them to think about how they can do better. This has been a very good engagement place, and they've also bought into the idea that while they look at policies related to nitrogen in air, they are ready to look at the whole nitrogen cycle and how they can find synergies and benefits with other areas. So this is a really good example so far. And lastly, the marine one, the water one, this is a tough name because GPA doesn't tell you much. Global Programme of Action for the Protection of the Marine Environment from Land-Based Activities. Um, this we're learning to. I was at the last meeting. The main problem is that the last meeting was in 2012. The next meeting is in Bali this autumn in 2017. So they have one meeting every five years. And the Secretariat, new Secretariat realizes that their main problem is they have no intercessional process. So they try to turn up at the last meeting and come up with this ambition for a 20% improvement in nitrogen use efficiency. Of course, the country, some of the countries objected simply because they had not had five years to prepare the way that they would actually do it. So one of the things I'm working with UNEP to do to encourage them is say, prepare in advance so that when you get there, there's no new surprises for the countries. 
And this is not rocket science for international stakeholder engagement. Everybody should know and you need to prepare in advance. So that's a framework. The problem is they're not joining up. And what we're proposing is that we need to better develop this thing we're calling the policy arena for nitrogen. And at a certain point, some scientists were saying, let's have a nitrogen convention. And the message from the stakeholders has been, well, we really don't want a nitrogen convention. We have enough conventions. Go away and work with the existing. But we try to work with the existing, we find each of those issues. So I think the issue, what we're looking at now is to say, how can we get something that is getting each of these to talk to each other? And how can IMS, as an evidence generation system, feed into these one by one, but also stimulate this and stimulate their better cooperation to a more joint approach? Now, back to the stakeholders, because stakeholders are tricky things. And if you want to quiet scientific life, and you want to publish a lot, and make big progress in your career, do not talk to stakeholders. Just publish a paper, get it accepted, go to the next paper. Now, this is true actually, but life is changing because actually what you should really do is do both. You should do the paper publication, you must, but also engage with the world. And one of the reasons to do it, apart from being vaguely interesting and vaguely useful, is because this engagement will change your mind and change your agenda for what the next papers you will write will be. So you will gain from it, even if you don't get the next paper quite so quickly. So we present this to stakeholders who are difficult people. And I like this diagram. I'm quite pleased with it. And I've got a little about you know, what's our goal? Improving economy-wide nitrogen use efficiency. The diagram is simple. We present it to stakeholders. What do they do? They do this. And uh, they say, you've forgotten, and you've forgotten, and you've forgotten. Please add in, and please remember. And don't forget the intergovernmental partners, and don't forget the specialist partners. And don't forget that you've got to do all of these things. The several there, the Commission for Sustainable Development, the Su Sustainable Development Goals is there, World Trade Organization, added in. So it becomes a much richer, much harder game, but nevertheless, the good thing is you listen to the stakeholders, let them know that you've listened, we have listened, and now it's up to you as stakeholders to say what we're going to prioritize. And maybe we're going to prioritize those anyway, but we're not forgetting those. And things like how we're going to get involved in the World Trade Organization. Maybe one of you will go to a meeting and start getting engaged. Who knows? But we'll go step by step. And in this policy arena, looking towards um, what would be their coordination mechanism, let's see. We try to get it on the agenda at this next UNIA meeting, United Nations Environment Assembly, in December. And at the moment, we're working with some countries to invite them to come to Geneva in June where we'll say, will one of those countries sponsor a, a resolution at UNIA where UNIA resolves to work on the nitrogen cycle? Whether we win that this time or not, let's see, but at least we're giving it a shot. So that's the, really the big. Now I'm going to finish with public engagement. And, oops, there we go. Hang on, this is all going back in now. There we are. So we showed this picture. We did the European nitrogen assessment, got lots of press. One of the press articles we got was this. And this is a really interesting picture, because you, you, in a way I like it, but in a way it's awful. Uh, I showed this picture in the United States Department of Agriculture in Washington. And when I said it, somebody shot up from the audience and shouted at me, you cannot show that picture. It's a great stakeholder reaction. <laughs> and he, he said, I work for FAO, if I were to show that picture, I would get fired. Said, wow, that's very interesting. I, I'm glad I don't work for FAO. I've not been fired. I think, so it wasn't my choice of picture, it was the choice of picture by Metro, but they knew that they chose it because they would get a reaction. They're looking for people to read the article. I will carry on showing it every now and then because it gets a reaction that we know food choice is a huge thing, um, that you like, don't like, and hate the picture. That's part of the game. So we're learning in that. We're learning about press engagement. And uh, we're also learning other techniques. And uh, so I invented a new word. We used it earlier, which was demeterian. Demeterian is half meat consumption. We had a declaration, the Barsat Declaration. 200 scientists signed the Barsat Declaration and said, when we organize our conferences, we will make available the option for half meat consumption. So we are doing something ourselves. 
We're not exactly campaigning, but we're taking action ourselves. And that word got picked up in this book, uh, Etymology, it's a book you can buy for your friends for Christmas. And, um, and it's by, by letter, here's Demeterian. They've, they've taken our definition, they've put it into a nice form. Demeterian comes immediately after crop swap and before drunkorexia. And drunkorexia is where you stop eating food so that you can get all of your calories from alcohol. <laughs> Anyway, so it, we're out there in the real world, um, but this is product placement, if you've come across product placement. My product is nitrogen, and we've managed to place nitrogen in this book, because you read about the Barset Declaration, the Nitrogen in Europe program, and you get a little sentence about nitrogen. You read about the environmental effect, 2000 report by the UNECE, nitrogen on the table, says this and this and this in an incredibly brief way, so we're seeding society to start hearing about nitrogen. I think this is, we need to keep pushing on this sort of game for stakeholder engagement. So let's um, just think about a few rules for press engagement. So first is be completely honest. Don't hide anything. They are really smart people, journalists. They may not know the science, but they know you deeply, and they know when you're lying. So you have to be completely honest and be completely straight about all your uncertainties. And they really don't mind uncertainties. It's fine. Um, so simplify and find the hook. Know what you want to say, because you may only have one minute to say it in. Particularly when you're on the radio, you get, you've got to say your main point first, and you get a second point. And if you've got a third point ready, the interview may have already finished. Um, keep it simple but be ready to back up with more if they ask you. So if you declare we'll have a 20% improvement in nitrogen use efficiency and save 170 billion euro, then they say, okay, but how did you calculate that? You have to be ready to then substantiate. Um, repeat and reinforce your message. This is a really interesting lesson because as a scientist, you think I, almost, I must always do something new because the next paper must be new, and then I'll move on to another paper and a new one, a new message each time. But with press, the message is otherwise. It's find what is your main message and say it again and again and again. The world needs to know nitrogen. You know, that's simple, really. Um, why does it need to know it? Because it's got all these wages and effects all over. It's the godfather of environment pollution, the thing that's pulling the strings. You don't see it, but it's behind all the challenges we know so well and say it again and again. So, as a scientist, we want to give a new message each time, but in press, you need to repeat and reinforce. And I mean on different occasions, not in the same interview. Um, but, and then, of course, that's building up the message more clearly. And be ready at any moment. Um, I, I had one um, last year, where it was a radio interview, and it was a big show, so it's a good opportunity to get on. They rang me on a Sunday evening to say, could I comment on an article because somebody else would go on. And I commented and I said, it's fine, go with it. And later the night, they said, the person has dropped out. Can you go in the show? It's at 6 in the morning. Can you be at the radio interview place at 6 in the morning? So I said, OK, I'll do it, no problem. And I decided to go half an hour early, just in case. And 20 minutes before I was there, on the way there, and I was already there, they said, we've moved your slot 20 minutes forward. If you can't be here in 10 minutes, we'll cut you. But fortunately, I decided to go half an hour early. But it indicates those guys are living really on the edge. And if you want your media opportunity, you need to be ready for it to be cancelled at any moment and avoid the chances of it being cancelled. So those are some major principles. And find new hooks. So how long can a hook last? How long can the food story, for example, last? Now, when we first did the food story, we, it was 2008. And it was quite new for them, eat less meat. They said, oh, we haven't heard about this. And it was on the edge, and the UNEC did not want us to talk about it. Now, bosses refused to release our press releases, which means it's excellent for newspapers, if your bosses don't want to let the message out. But now it's getting acceptable. So we have to develop and refresh new angles each time. So this is what I explore. Uh, I explore some of these. I'll give you a couple of crazy ones to finish. These will not necessarily make big press but they're part of a personal exploration for fun in the game. So the first one that I have fun with is looking at the history of um, nitrogen. And the nitrogen had an economy running in the Silk Road. Nitrogen was being traded there 
whatever, a thousand years ago. Um, the nitrogen came from coal, which is buried in the hills. It's a very hot climate, so the coal caves just start spontaneously burning. And as the coal burns, forever and ever, this is through this hole, you start getting white crystals around the surface. Ammonium sulfate, ammonium chloride, ammonium nitrate. And the people collect that, particularly they're unemployed, it's the main one, collect it and sell it. They use it in medicine, use it in metallurgy. Um, whole question is when they start using it as a fertilizer, but they were using it and selling it. Um, this is where they were doing it, and I'm very disappointed to have missed Rosario this morning, because Rosario uh, has been to Samarkand, and I'm really jealous, because this was the main trading point of, on the Silk Road, through the middle from China in the east, going through the Tianxian Mountain, Central Asia, and these uh, golden dots were the places where they were buying and selling the nitrogen. The stuff in China was called Naosha, um, and there's a tax record. And if you look at these shoes, these are shoes, paper shoes, which were made of old tax records, and they're found in the desert, the Taklakaman Desert. They've been deciphered and read, and they provide lots of records of the price of nitrogen in 600 AD. Um, this is the price of nitrogen. Spice at five, spice is five silver points per kilogram. Nushadra, which is the nitrogen, six silver points. Silk, 17. Um, in fact, interesting, I can compare this with data from Egypt from a few centuries later, and it's amazingly consistent, actually, nine silver points uh, per kilogram. It's amazing. There's the same quality silver points 400 years later and halfway around the world. So nitrogen was a quality product traded over huge distances in the world um, over a thousand years ago. At this point, I appear to get sexist, and I'm not sexist. It's just that the data is limited. Because it just so happens that if you want to convert that into some units, what the silver coins mean, you need the unit called the price of a female slave. Because both data sets have the price of a female slave. Samarkand was the best place to buy male and female slaves, but I happen to have the price of those. And so basically, you can compare this kilogram of nitrogen to the price of a female slave. Six kilos of nitrogen gets you a human being. This is telling you that nitrogen, through the centuries, from feeding the world, from bombs, to the fundamentals of society, has been with us for thousands of years. Now, whether I ever get some press after this is another question, but I'm having fun with it. Um, and I think in the end, at some point, go down a funny journey, and you'll come up with some interesting things. To finish, I should tell you that Nushadra, which is nitrogen, um, ammonia chloride, is a bacterial sodium word, and its etymology is immortal fire. So the first known public word for a nitrogen compound in civilization is immortal fire. And there's a whole other lecture on the topic of why that is. But hey, it's pretty good as a name for nitrogen. So let's uh, finish with two things. I'll get sensible again in a minute. Um, I'm going to tell you that there's nitrogen in Homer, in the Odyssey, in the Iliad. And um, there's a whole debate as to how you should read Homer. Some will say there's lots of allegory in it, and I will say they are right. And those who say there's no allegory in Homer don't know what they're talking about. Um, and uh, in a section where Proteus, Proteus is a shape-shifting old man of the sea, uh, Menelaus has been becalmed on a little island off Alexandria, which didn't exist then, but he's been calmed. He can't get away. And um, Proteus' daughter speaks to Idithi and tells Menelaus how he can capture Proteus. Proteus is, in an in a allegorical way, an image of nitrogen or some nitrogen compound. So remember, nitrogen takes on all sorts of different forms and character as it's processed, and just as Proteus is doing. So Idithia says to Menelaus, if thou couldst in any wise wait and catch Proteus, he will tell thee the way and measure of thy path. When the sun has reached mid heaven and the unerring old man of the sea, that's Proteus, is wont to come forth from the bride, the breath of the west wind concealed by the black ripple, then we, men and us, he says, threw our hands about Proteus. We caught him, and nor did the old man forget his crafty art as we tried to trap him. Nay, at first he turned into a well bearded lion, and then into a serpent, then into a leopard, and then into a great boar, and then he turned into moist water. Under a tree higher leafing. 
But when at last the whole band skilled in wizard arts grew weary, then he questioned me and then he spoke. And at this point, finally, Menelaus has a dialogue with Proteus and they start to understand each other. So I'll tell you, with reasons not completely explained, it was nicely in that story, and at some point, there could be press in explaining why that is the case. So, I'm not sure how much time we have left. I have enough for a few questions for a bit of discussion for you to think about your own work, what you do, where you engage with stakeholders. Um, so, who are your stakeholders? Would be my question. How to develop your stakeholder links? What are you doing? What might you do? What action would be the thing you are interested in? Um, are you interested in local case studies? Are you interested in international agenda? Working with business or NGOs? Engaging the press? There's different angles. So I think we might have a few questions, but I would encourage also, let's see how we get on with a few questions, you to discuss amongst yourselves a bit, and then maybe we can discuss together what you think your own angles are in this stakeholder world. Thank you. general questions, but then I think we should address some feedback back to you. I think so. Thanks. One general question there. Um, in terms of uh, public engagement, I, think, I don't think you mentioned social media at all. I was just wondering, do you feel that uh, engaging with the public is still best done via what's now called traditional media, or is that its own subject? Um, I, think, I think social media is great. The one I mentioned where the radio rang me up on the Sunday evening, we'd done a traditional press, no, we wanted to do a traditional press release through our press office. And our press office refused and said, your story is boring, you cannot have a press release. So anyway, the scientist had done a blog that somehow he'd linked, whether he tweeted or whatever, we'd done a blog. And an NGO in Brussels came across his blog. Then the NGO, did a press release, the Guardian picked up on his press release, the Times picked up on it, and then since the Guardian the Times had picked up on it, then the radio took it. And it was all driven through a social media approach. So there we go. Thank you.